Having interviewed many aspiring and experienced professionals, I can tell you that if you combine two or three of the options above, you are going to be ahead of most. And who knows, maybe I can even hire you for my team. But I can promise anything. Hello Spartans and welcome to Cyber Spartan Coaching Minutes with yours truly. Following up on last week's video, today I'm going to talk about practicing to sharpen your skills. Let's begin. Let's start with a surprise quiz. How many tips have I given you last week in case you wanted to be a self-taught professional? I hear five from that gentleman over there. I hear seven from that lady over there. Thank you. And I hear, I hear, is it, what is that? Three, exactly, three. Last week I gave you three tips for you to become a self-taught cybersecurity professional. It is clear that you are not paying attention. So go back to my previous video and watch it again. Now I mentioned three tips last week, but there are two tips that I didn't talk about. And these two tips are practicing and demonstrating your skills. And today, once more, because practicing requires some time to be talked about, I'm going to focus only on practicing in this video. If you are struggling to land a job in cybersecurity, chances are all those certifications that you have been collecting as if they were Exodia parts are not really helping you. Because there is one thing really important that is missing, long hours of practice. Certifications are only as good as the practice that supports them. Practice builds experience and experience is what ultimately gets you a job. Practice is what precedes demonstration, which is nothing more than just selling yourself. But this is a topic for another video. Now, if you are wondering how can you practice, there are a couple of options. Let's go over them. The first one is do the labs for the books you read and the courses that you take. Now, let me tell you a secret. I'm a really lazy person. I just hate practice sections in books and courses because they usually just disrupt my reading flow. Additionally, I have to get up from the couch and fetch a pen or, God forbid, sitting at my desk. Now, I'm serious. It's really painful. This is my uh, complaining uh, Portuguese side. Now, Portuguese people, jokes aside, the practice sections in courses and books serve a purpose. The purpose is to reinforce the technical skills taught beforehand. Now, when you go through these exercises, it's not uncommon for people to, and I've been guilty of this in the past, to just get to the solution immediately and move on. But you must really take your time to understand these labs and these practice sections and take your time to finish them and work on them. Pay attention to code, to commands, to inputs, to outputs, and also to what is happening. Take your time to even read outside of the lab to really understand what is happening there. Now, funny story, when I was learning reverse engineering, when I started, I, I started reading practical malware analysis, which at the time at FireEye was a must read for every analyst. And I really took my time to go through each one of the labs and really understand the samples inside out. I took really my time to just reverse every piece of the sample that, I've, that I was looking at. And I remember this sample, which was probably on the second or third lab, where I found a function that was extremely complex. It was a monster of a function. And it took me a week to actually reverse it, even though I never managed to reverse it entirely. I was moving slowly, but surely. And this is when I began to feel hopeless and telling myself, you know what, Bruno, maybe this is not for you. This is too complicated. Reverse engineering is for smart people. You, you, you will never make it. And you are going to just embarrass your parents. In the depths of my despair, I even considered going to perhaps India or Southeast Asia just to find myself. Now, one evening as I was going through the third bottle of Chardonnay to drown my sorrows, I actually decided to take a look at the solutions. And it turns out that the function that I was looking at was printf. And this was a function that was statically linked when it was compiled together with the binary. As you can imagine, I just called off the trip immediately. Now, aside from my struggle with the printf function, I really didn't consider traveling to Southeast Asia and I didn't drink heavily because of this. And also, we all know that our parents think that cybersecurity professionals just fix computers. So being disappointed is something that they are used to. The second tip that I have for you is have pet projects. And this can be a home lab, it can be offensive security tool that you are working on, on any framework. Now, before I move on, let me ask you a couple of questions. How successful do you want to be in cybersecurity? 
Do you just want to collect a paycheck or do you actually want to be really good at it? The kind of person that companies fight for. The second question is, does working on your side project excite you? You get butterflies in your stomach every time you think about a new feature that you are going to add, some thing that you are going to tune in your tool. If you answer yes to both of these questions, I can tell you that you are going to be a top performer in this industry and a very good cybersecurity professional. Why? Because you are driven by passion. And this is a major asset that not everyone in the industry actually has. Having side projects or pet projects showcases several traits that I considered of utmost importance in any professional in the cybersecurity field, regardless of their level. The first one is you are entrepreneurial. You seek to solve problems and take matters into your own hands to find the solution. And this is a major asset for any company because it is true that there are some employees that just want to press buttons and do their jobs, but the ones that really get ahead and really get promoted are the ones that are entrepreneurial. They are the ones that look around, they find inefficiencies, and they try to address them. So this is a very good trait to have, and this is something that side projects show. The second one is that you see cybersecurity as a marathon, not as a sprint, because you keep improving your tool or your lab over time. You demonstrate consistency and are content with incremental change, which is something that you are going to find in your day-to-day -day job. When you join a, a team, and it, this also depends on the stage of the team, at the beginning, you are going to have a lot of impact. You are going to create new tools. You are going to develop new processes. But at some point, you are going to just work and improve the things that you already built before or that have been built by someone else. This is why working on a side project or a pet project is good because you are going to be used to be consistent and add incremental changes to your project. The third trait, the third and final trait is that you are willing to sacrifice your leisure time, your free time to advance your career and your skills. And if on top of this you are passionate about it, you come from a place of passion and not obligation, you are in a very good position because being willing to sacrifice your time and work on something with passion is a little combination that is going to put you ahead of most cybersecurity professionals. As with everything, there are caveats with this, with this idea. And this is something that is important to mention. The first caveat is that you must choose your projects wisely. And if you watched my first video or second, depending on how you count them, I've talked about this. I've mentioned that when you choose a project at work or at home, either a project for work or a side project, you must choose the project wisely. Now, choosing a side project is outside of the scope of this video. However, I will leave you with a small taste of what you can expect in future videos. Based on my experience, a good project, a project that is relevant to you, to your career, should have two characteristics. The first one is it entails several skills. And the second one, it's reusable. For the first one, what I mean is that your project should allow you to learn and test several skills. It can be programming, pen testing, security engineering, etc. And what I mean by reusable is that your tool or your idea should be something that you can apply in the future somewhere, something that you can use at your workplace, something that you can sell perhaps, something that you can use for a tool that is going to be used by the community. A project doesn't really need to have these two requirements, but if it has them, then it's a winner project and you should definitely pursue it. If it doesn't have either of these, then it's probably better to move on to something else. The second caveat I want to mention is that projects have an expiration date. Now, there are two types of perfectionist people. There are the people that don't even start projects or leave the projects half-baked because they can never be perfect or good enough. And there are the people that are driven by perfectionism, but to the point where they just burn and waste time working on features and projects that are just not worth the time. And they are not advancing their skills or career in any way. If you find yourself refactoring large bases of code just to change a few names of variables here and there, or perhaps you are losing sleep because your ASCII art prompt for your tool doesn't really look as you'd like it to, then you have to stop. Never forget that project serve a purpose. So when you start a project, ask yourself, what is the purpose of this project? What am I getting out of this? What do I want to learn? Also, projects have relevant functionality and they have nice to have features. Are you spending a lot of time just adding nice to have features that are not really adding anything 
to your skills or advancing you in any way, just repeating previous tasks for skills that you have already mastered before. In this case, never forget that for projects the 80-20 rule applies, the Pareto principle. Projects are never finished. So don't waste time finishing a project, just make sure that the project is good enough, just be done with the objectives that you had about that project and move on to something else. And no practicing discussion is complete without mentioning CTFs and online labs. And I've saved this one for last because personally it's the one that I use the least as I feel that labs and CTFs tend to be better for areas such as incident response and forensics, offensive security or reverse engineering. And in my case, because I prefer blue team in security engineering, I prefer side projects. Now there are plenty of online CTFs and labs, but there is something that you must bear in mind. A lot of these labs, or I like to think that most of them try to be as high fidelity as possible, meaning that they should reflect what you would find in real life during your day-to-day -day tasks at your job. However, this is not always the case. And sometimes some of these CTFs or these labs are really contrived and they deviate a lot from what you'd expect when you work in cybersecurity. And as an example, I'm going to tell you about my first experience with a reverse engineering CTF, specifically reverse engineering. At the time I was finishing reading practical malware analysis, or I, I believe that at the time I already finished it. So I decided to play the flare on reverse engineering challenge which is a reverse engineering challenge organized by the Flare team from FireEye or ex-FireEye. Now, I managed to go through the second, first, second and third challenges, I believe. But at some point I reached one that I really couldn't finish. I just couldn't figure out the solution for it. And later I decided to discuss this challenge with a colleague of mine that was much more experienced in reverse engineering. And when he explained the solution to me, I thought to myself, there is no way I would, I would think about something like this because it was such a contrived solution that I even wondered if this would be something that I would find in my real life as a reverse engineer. Now, during my stay at Cisco, I can tell you that I've reversed pretty advanced samples with complex packers. And I don't remember a time when I found a sample that was so convoluted and weird as the one that I found in this flare on challenge. Now, some companies may include CTFs in the job specs as something that they would like to see in the candidate or a good to have. But I personally don't find that you not doing them or doing labs is something that makes you a less ideal professional for this specific position. Because as I mentioned above, some of these labs and some of these CTFs can be quite contrived and they don't really reflect what you would expect in your job. They usually don't test your technical capabilities only, they tend to test your out of the box thinking capabilities. However, I highly recommend that you try these labs and you go through these CTFs because they add extra value to your repertoire and can make a difference if a recruiter or a hiring manager is deciding between two candidates. And there you have it Spartans. Three ways for you to practice your cybersecurity skills. Labs for books and courses, pet projects, and online labs and CTFs. At the end of the day, you must figure out what you want to get out of this practice and choose the resource that best fits your needs and requirements. Having interviewed many aspiring and experienced professionals, I can tell you that if you combine two or three of the options above, you are going to be ahead of most. And who knows, maybe I can even hire you for my team, but I can promise anything. Now feel free to leave any comments or questions below because at the end of the day, this content is for you. Now until next time, stay safe, stay paranoid.